Okay, good morning, everyone. Call to order the meeting of the California High Speed Rail Authority. And if we could start and stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Thank you, and we will start with uh, public comments, and I have three of them, starting with uh, David Schwegel. Are we on? Yes. All right, here we go. Greetings, HSR Board. David Schwegel with Apex Civil Engineering. Three items. First, I'm pleased to see that the project was the star of the show at the Economic Summit, and I encourage all of us to stay in the conversation on driving the economy forward with infrastructure. Barry Broom is confirmed for the California Statewide Infrastructure Symposium on Friday, April 3rd, 2020 at the Hilton Garden West here in Sacramento, and ASCE is gonna be spending out speaker uh, invitations to both you, Chair Mendoza, as well as Director Arambula, Second off, Cascadia Rail Summit was well worth the 929 mile drive up to Microsoft. The main takeaway for us based on that summit is see what we can do to transform Fresno Clovis into a destination that rivals that of Vancouver, BC. They have amazing synergy. Microsoft alone, the host of the summit, invested $600,000 just to study Seattle to Vancouver, BC HSR within the greater Seattle Angel Hair Pasta Bowl that extends down to Portland and up to Vancouver, BC. They basically need to build the system, otherwise they're gonna watch as the Cascadia Innovation Corridor, 316 mile long, becomes a parking lot. And third and finally, I just wanted to make sure that among the consultants that we are encouraging industry engagement as well as factually representing the longevity of positions. Because I know when I was change order manager for CP23, I really would have liked to have the opportunity to attend the entire US High Speed Rail Association conference in Los Angeles, April and May, so I can learn change order management best practices from around the world. And to make sure that when someone is claiming that, hey, the position uh, is long-term and we only hire long-term, that they are actually able to deliver as opposed to uh, laying someone off 11 weeks later. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Schwegel. The next comment is from Jacqueline Broder. Hello, my name is Jacqueline Broder. I'm with UC Berkeley, and I'm here today to invite everyone to a workshop we are hosting with Caltrans on high-speed rail station access. The workshop will be at 1 o'clock p.m. in the Eureka Room of the Capitol, and we have panelists from both the public and private sectors, and we'd love to hear your input. Thank you. Thank you, and apologize for mispronouncing your name. No, it's okay. And what, what day is it again? I'm sorry. sorry today. today, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, Troy Hightower, and I know Troy, you have two comments, so we'll go ahead and extend your time a little bit to make both of them. Good morning, Chairman, board members and staff. My name is Troy Hightower. Uh, I'm an independent transportation consultant with my own firm down in Bakersfield, California. Um, I, and along with others in Kern County, do support the high-speed rail project in general. I have two comments. One is related to agenda item number two, the maintenance facilities. I'd like the board to um, consider the two sites that Kern County uh, proposed in the original call for projects, one in Wasco and one in uh, Shafter. Um, I believe in the presentation, there's mention that the light maintenance facility and the heavy maintenance facility should be co-located. So I'd also like you to reconsider that. I, I can understand the light maintenance facilities being close to stations, but I do believe that the maintenance, heavy maintenance facility is better located in the center of the overall system, which will be within Kern County. 
my second comment is I'd like you to consider using the existing Amtrak station in downtown Bakersfield as an interim high-speed rail station as you build out the high-speed rail infrastructure. That station is relatively new. It was built with extra capacity, anticipating high-speed rail. They built a new parking lot that has EV charging stations. And of course, it has the train, I mean, the bus connections to all of Southern California, Palmdale, and Las Vegas. As you all know, high speed rail trains do not approach the stations at high speed. So they, they must slow down before they go to the station. So this interim um, station would require slowing down and maybe going on the existing rail. However, since high speed rail needs to slow down to go in and out of the station, I think that impact would be minimal. But the key um, benefits would be the savings in cost where you can move forward. I know you're looking at a $4 billion um, cost for extending the Bakersfield. And the most I believe is building the ridership. Um, I ride the train regular. I came on the train here. I think that um, by using that as an interim station, we can start building ridership so that people will start using the train more often. And um, I believe that every new rider on the train from today on will help meet our impacts that we have with air quality in the Central Valley. With that, I, I thank you for your time and I appreciate your consideration of my comments. Thank you, Mr. Hightower. And we do have, I did get one more comment from Mark Hamilton. <laughs> As the board and Mr. Chairman, my name is Mark Council, see you at Can you turn them? Thank you, sorry, I apologize for that. My name is Mark Hamilton, the CHL Chuchilla. We'd like to consider the CHL for location of, if not the heavy maintenance facility, for some of the other facilities due to the following. We are a disadvantaged community. We are also located within the central California. We are at the intersection of Highway 152 and Highway 99. Our community um, has experienced a lot of challenges, but with the with the location of the Y, we are essentially located to the Bay Area, to Sacramento, and to Fresno. And we feel for those reasons that we are a ideal location for the head maintenance facility. We have also one property owner who owns the site that was considered the, with our one of our well, with our submittals. Additionally, um, the Y is. Uh, at that at the juncture where it can be a, a huge asset to the whole state as a whole, being the um, location to the Fres city of Fresno, Madera County, as well as the the, the, the connection line. As previously submitted, um, Madera County Y Task Force has been encouraging the uh, Hydro Rail Committee to look at our area, being Madera County, due to its differential aspects, being the um, the community fair meet, the educational, being Chachel United School District. Also, its location to education, being Fresno State, Stanislaus, UC Merced, as well as other numerous community colleges in our area. And we feel that the location of this facility would be able to be better served with a lot of the state um, educational services within the area that could really grow and prosper not only the communities, but also improve the educational and training of our underserved um, youth in our area. We appreciate your time and consideration. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. And I do not see any more public comment cards. So we will move on to the, uh, the board ag regular agenda. And I'd like to start with some comments of, of my own before we hit, hit the uh, conversation around the board minutes. Uh, just a little over two weeks ago, I attended the California Economic Summit in Fresno to, among other things, discuss the governor's Regions Rise Together initiative and the plan for focusing key state attention on regions of the state that have been largely left behind while other regions have thrived. The summit included an oversubscribed and terrific tour of the high-speed rail construction going on in Fresno, ably led by Diana. Thank you for doing that, Diana. Uh, 
the Regions Rise Together initiative that we discussed recognizes the dynamism and economic potential of communities in California that have not experienced the same robust growth as the coastal areas of the state, the Bay Area, Silicon Valley, Los Angeles, and San Diego. Regions Rise Together is about encouraging a vibrant, inclusive, and sustainable economy by changing the mental map of California and connecting all of California so that we have a California for all. The governor made a number of key announcements at the economic summit, and I'm particularly pleased with his expressed, where he expressed his continued and unequivocal said the following, let's get this 170 mile project done. My commitment in the state of the state was to refocus our efforts, double down on the Central Valley, but to extend it to Merced and Bakersfield. We have framed that 171 miles and we can get this project done. The project is taking shape, people are working. We are bringing clarity and focus with new board leadership, new transparency and new accountability. We are 18 to 24 months out from all environmental work being done for the entire first phase from San Francisco to Los Angeles. He concluded with saying, for me, this is not an ideological endeavor. It's a pragmatic endeavor and we're gonna get it done. I was pleased to see that statement and reinforcing what the governor has said before. This board is charged with fulfilling a mission defined in law and approved by California voters. Our mission is clear, deliver electrified high-speed rail to California a mission that advances our policy objectives related to both protecting our environment while growing our economy and creating economic opportunity and mobility. Like the governor, I'm convinced the best way to do that is to move forward on the 175, 171 mile interim service connecting Merced, Fresno and Bakersfield with electrified high-speed rail service. This would represent the first building block for delivering on the rest of the system. This approach, according to our early train operator, would have numerous benefits for California. It would reduce the travel time to the valley by 90 to 100 minutes. It would provide faster, more frequent, and more reliable passenger service than is currently available in the valley. Through partnerships with other operators, it would enhance connectivity and accessibility to other passenger rail services in Merced, where the legislature has committed nearly $1 billion to bring the ACE service and connect to our system and Amtrak. It would provide the highest ridership potential and fair, fair revenue of any Central Valley option. And it would improve air quality in the Central Valley by shifting from diesel to clean electrified trains, an essential step in addressing the air quality issues in the Central Valley. It would allow us to put assets constructed for high-speed rail use by allowing for early testing of electrified high-speed rail operations. I appreciate that there are some members of this board appointed by different appointing authorities who may have different views to move forward. However, this board has done a lot over the course of the last year to clarify our focus and determination to meet this mission. We've settled litigation. We selected pre preferred alternatives for Northern and Southern California segments. We have adopted a revised baseline budget to meet our project challenges. We sought and received NEPA assignment from the federal government. We certified our first record of decision of Bakersfield in five years, and we're adopting a strategy and schedule to ensure that we meet our federal funding agreement deadlines, just as we committed to do in the 2018 business plan. I'm not interested in moving backwards. As we've learned before, dithering costs time and money. We need to progress with a clear, focused sense of purpose and urgency. I intend to move forward on decisions we must make to ensure that we meet our federal commitments and deliver electrified high-speed rail to Californians consistent with that mission. Members of this board have appropriately asked us to perform additional studies and analysis to confirm that the 171 mile Merced Fresno Bakersfield early interim service makes sense for us and is the best use of our limited resources. We will complete those studies and they will be incorporated into the draft 2020 business plan that the staff will propose to the board early next year. At that time, policymakers, the public, and the board will have ample time, 60 days, to review and comment on the draft plan. The board will have the opportunity to take that comment and shape the plan for its final release on May 1st, 2020, in line with the legislative requirements. I would remind people that there are, while there are some suggestions on different approaches right now, there is no question that the legislator legislature and executive leadership in California is united on transforming rail in this state to fast, clean, and efficient service. 
California leadership is setting the mark nationally for clean public transportation. We've made cap and trade dollars available to modernize rail and improve public transportation throughout the state. Billions of dollars have been awarded to transit operators in California to improve local and regional transit systems with an emphasis on the crucial task of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. California is also committed to constructing an electrified high-speed rail system connecting the Central Valley with the Bay Area and with Los Angeles. We are making good progress and we must continue down this path in an era of climate change that is today upon us. Toward that end, rather than cannibalize li limited existing resources dedicated to this project or to regional or local transit op uh, services, I hope we can expand the pie for all. For example, the cap and trade program in California funds this program and funds regional and local transit services. We have in the past business plan recommended actions to stabilize those funds. Doing this helps us expand resources for everyone rather than shifting existing scarce resources. Our 2020 business plan should evaluate how stabilizing cap and trade can benefit us all in our collective endeavor to provide faster, cleaner, connected, and efficient rail service at the state, regional, and local level. Again, our goals are clear in this regard and are not different. Let's stabilize the resources to ensure our collective success so that we can all have the rail services that we want rather than ill-advised fights over shared objectives. Thank you. So with that, if we could move to the uh, first. Oh, sorry, I needed to take roll for purposes to make sure we have our in line. Can you do roll, please? Good morning, Director Shank. Here. Vice Chair Richards. Here. Director Curtin. Here. Director Lowenthal. Here. Director Camacho. Here. Director Miller. Here. Senator Bell. Assemblymember Rambula. Chairman Donza. Here. Director Perea. Here. Director Gilmetti. We have a quorum. Thank you. Sorry for missing that in the order. So now we can move on to the first agenda item, uh, the approval of the minutes for the October 15th. Second. Are there any comments, corrections, or additions? Call the question, please. Director Shank? Aye. Vice Chair Richards? Yeah. Director Curtin? Yeah. Aye. Director uh, Camacho? Yeah. Director Miller? Chairman Donza? Yes. Director Perea? Aye. Director Gilmetti? Aye. Yeah. The motion carried. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to the next item, the high-speed rail maintenance facilities review. Uh, Frank, this is an item for information. Good morning, everyone. Frank Baca, Chief of Rail Operations for the Authority. I have a short informational presentation this morning for everyone to uh, just describe the facilities that will be required for our high-speed rail operations uh, as information for the board. And as further uh, decisions will have to be made uh, in the coming year uh, regarding these, these facilities. To begin with, uh, there are essentially five types of facilities uh, that we'll be constructing. Uh, maintenance away facility. And we'll describe what the purpose, uh, type of workers, uh, locations, and that type of uh, information as we go through this presentation. Operations Control Center, a heavy maintenance facility, which everyone's heard much about, um, headquarters location, and a uh, light maintenance facility. <clears throat> Essentially, uh, the maintenance away facility and the the OCC, the Operations Control Center, are associated with the track and systems procurement. Uh, they will have to be uh, located and, and uh, authorized to proceed as part of the NTP for the track and systems, which we anticipate uh, by next September of 2020. The heavy maintenance facility and the light maintenance facility are associated with the rolling stock procurement, uh, and they will be constructed by, by that contractor and we anticipate uh, that decision and, and uh, will be part of the NTP for that contract anticipated December of 2020. And then finally, the headquarters location or facility is associated with the train operator, and we anticipate that contract in the NTP in the uh, January 2024 timeframe. 
as you can see, there's uh, each facility. Uh, we've listed what we anticipate the number of facilities that are needed, one in the Central Valley and two for all of phase one. So the maintenance away facilities, we anticipate one in the Central Valley and four overall uh, spread out through the, through the uh, phase one uh, alignment and we'll describe why in, in a few minutes. Uh, we anticipate the need for one uh, control center for the system, uh, one heavy maintenance facility for the system, uh, one headquarter facility for the system, and uh, light maintenance facilities are distributed at the terminal points and anticipate three for the final system. Maintenance away facility. The maintenance away facilities are, are used to, to headquarter uh, our infrastructure maintainer. They're used as a marshalling area uh, for the infrastructure maintainer to, uh, one, uh, have headquarters for the workforce, have training facilities, uh, marshal the, uh, the equipment that they need for their maintenance operation, uh, the, and uh, training, and it's also uh, a warehousing for the uh, spare parts and, and uh, maintenance, maintenance uh, testing and, and, uh, and workforce. The, the maintenance facilities are geographically spread through the system to achieve one thing in prior, uh, as, as an absolute requirement, and that is to be able to respond to a maintenance area at night, travel to it, do the work, and be back in five hours. So travel time to, to a work site and back is critical to ensure that we don't spend too much time traveling back and forth. So the facilities are spaced to, to minimize the travel time in the 30 to 45 uh, minute time frame each direction in order to get as much work done each night. The system is designed to be shut down between midnight and 5 a.m. maintenance. And that'll be the only maintenance window. And it's critical that these facilities are appropriately spaced and located to ensure maximize, maximum work time. Uh, the, the facilities are approximately 30 <laughs> acres uh, in size. They need to be as close to the main line as possible to minimize, again, building extensive leads or tracks to get to the main line. They require a connection to a freight main line so that heavy deliveries, rail, and other uh, type of material can be delivered via the freight line alignment. Um, <clears throat> those are all critical parts of locating these facilities. We anticipate about 100 people yeah. as a staffing level per uh, infrastructure maintenance uh, facility. The type of, uh, of work being done by, by this workforce is welding, machinists, uh, electronic techs for signaling communication high voltage uh, work for our substations and our cat uh, obviously uh, supervisory personnel and uh, warehousing and asset management type personnel and that those are the skills that we require for the people in that that in that facility mr chairman can i ask a quick question so um is it used for construction this is for this track, is tracking systems construction is it are there actual well, maintenance facilities in place now or no we would use these sites uh, for lay down areas and for prep for doing construction okay uh and so they, do you it, have some now no this well our environmental documents uh did clear did, did look at uh, both uh sites for heavy maintenance facilities and and uh maintenance away facilities uh, as part of the document, so they were they were cleared at a programmatic level. However, they will require further work. Okay, so we're not there yet for, for the construction portion of it in terms of the tracks, right? So what you use we, them for for lay down? For they would be used okay. for for lay down. Right? All right, I that's it. correct. Thanks Thank for staging. Yes, yeah. yeah. wasn't quick. Yeah. Second facility type is our operational control center. Uh, essentially, this is this is our, 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 the heart of dispatching trains, no different than the air traffic controller. Our dispatcher for trains uh, is in this facility. It's also our dispatching for high voltage power as a utility would dispatch power and, and monitoring the conditions of our infrastructure, both the high voltage as, as well as the conditions of their signaling system, uh, communication system and other, uh, and other systems. It's, it's the headquarters for responding for emergency responders, for communication to our police. Uh, communication to our passengers via uh, stations or the communications on board trains. Uh, it provides uh, overall uh, oversight of, of everything that's happening on the system. It's a 24-7 type of operation. 
uh, the type of facility uh, would be uh, an office type environment. Uh, and uh, starting initial operations, we anticipate about 40 to 50 people uh, on a 24 7 type operation. Can be located anywhere in the system, ideally, uh, because it's solid state. It should be close to the railroad because it'll be uh, heavily utilizing our fiber optic system for communication and for, for logistics to all the uh, infrastructure sites, monitoring. Heavy maintenance facility. Our heavy maintenance facility uh, is a shop environment. Its primary role is for the uh, maintenance and overhaul of our rolling stock equipment. Uh, it can be used for the initial uh, assembly of the train sets uh, and will be used for, for periodic uh, larger maintenance type of operations. Uh, as we talk about the light maintenance, you'll see that that is the day-to-day -day maintenance, the lighter maintenance, but the heavy maintenance facility is where you take a train out of service for a period of time to do major work. It becomes a major focal point during mid-life rebuild. Uh, the trains have a useful life of about 30 years. Uh, mid-life, mid about 15, you do a major teardown. Uh, and at that point, you would staff up for the heavy maintenance facility to do that we midlife rebuild for a number of years and then wind back down during normal operations. Um, it's also will be used for the initial testing and commissioning of our trains, uh, as well as possibly uh, assembly. Mm -hmm. This facility should be located near a freight main line because you need to potentially bring in uh, parts, bogies, trucks, uh, or what have you, as part of maintenance. It also needs possibly bringing in the cars and the trains via freight based on what, who the uh, successful bidder is and where their uh, the shop location is. It's about 150 or 60 acre facility. Uh, should be a, uh, also adjacent to our main line to minimize uh, extensive lead tracks to be built and costs associated with that. Uh, the initial uh, staffing level uh, during both assembly and, and during the routine annual, you know, annual maintenance type structures is about you know, 65, 75, 80 personnel. Uh, it will grow to several hundred during the midlife rebuilds and then wind back down after that, that kind of operation has been completed. <clears throat> Headquarters uh, is exactly as it sounds. It's the, it's the head area for the op operator and their staff. This essentially does a head operations functionality uh, the head of the operations, the CFO, the um, safety operations, the organization as, it, as it's required for day-to-day -day operations and management of the railroad, uh, again, can be located anywhere in the system, uh, possibly co-located co with the uh, operations control center on the same site or any other sites. Uh, anticipate 80 to 90 uh, supervisory and technical staff type members at that location. Um, light maintenance facility is the second of the rolling stock facilities. Essentially, this is this is the facility as close to the end terminals as you can get, so that you would store trains there overnight to be available during the day to start services at the, uh, Los Angeles and at San Francisco and in uh, Central Valley would be near said. Uh, this facility would uh, service, clean, uh, test, inspect for daily service. You would have, uh, you would have waste uh, removal and uh, all the requirements to, to move a train every day. It does minor repairs uh, that can be done on site without a large building or a lot, without large jack. You can replace bulbs, you can you know, uh, replace switches or whatever might have failed for a day-to-day -day operational requirement. It also will be the headquarters for our train crews, our engineers and our conductors, so that they have a place to report, pick up their train, and, and start the service for the day. Uh, as I said, it needs to be close to an endpoint terminal to minimize wasted revenue in, in moving trains, uh, what we call deadheading, without passengers. And uh, it's approximately 50 to 75 acre site close to the terminal and uh, coastal workforce. Uh, we expect uh, two 
for phase one and then uh, the third to the Central Valley. Our finance team has did a quick analysis of, of the economic impacts of these facilities and the workforce associated with these facilities, both uh, direct in terms of the actual salaries and, and expenses for the facilities as, as well as the material uh, purchases that supports the inventory uh, and, and supports the work that they're doing every day. And then finally, the induced uh, effects of housing, groceries, and, and those expenditures associated with the workforce and, and the facilities at large. And as you can see from this last slide, uh, what the direct, indirect, and induced uh, economic impacts are by for these facilities uh, individually uh, and as a total, and, and uh, I, we put that out there just as information. Uh, at this point, I have any any questions I'd like to answer for anyone. Any questions? Yeah, yeah I, I, do, I, I would just give a, a little more color to the how, Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, if you just give a little more color to how the decisions are going to be made so we have some transparency about what the thinking is now, uh, understanding right. that it might change later. So there'll be a, each of the facilities, I, I've given you a high level description of kind of the requirements. They yeah. need freight connections. They need to be close to our, our alignment. They need to be a certain size. Uh, they need to be their employment uh, opportunities for, for local. So that criteria is put together uh, and then uh, Perspective sites are then evaluated based on that criteria, uh, one. And then two, we have a set of criteria for uh, ensuring that the operation is as efficient as can be, as can be. minimize uh, throwaway costs, as I indicated. There's a term in the industry called deadheading, which means you're moving a train uh, with no customers, no one paying, so you're accumulating mileage and you're accumulating an engineer and, and crew without uh, receiving revenue, so you want to minimize uh, those kind of costs. So there's a set of criteria for each of these facilities, uh, both from an operational perspective and a physical perspective in terms of uh, what they require, and that evaluation then uh, will be put forth uh, to, 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 to come back with a staff recommendation on what the best sites are for the operation. Uh, are we going to have any um, requirements of the communities uh, that are being considered, uh, workforce development or other kinds of things that w we might. There were uh, several sites. I uh, I think there were nine sites uh, proposed from uh, from communities in terms of uh, the HMF, and and uh, what those sites offer will be part of the criteria in terms of uh, workforce, you know, available workforce, uh, distance to to uh, the centers of towns. So there is the human side of, the, of, of what the benefits are uh, for our employees being able to get to the work site. So with respect to the heavy maintenance facilities alone, there was an expression of interest right. but put out some time ago by the authority that got nine responses from various communities, including some that indicated uh, uh, the services they have around that area, uh, the location, the acreage, other elements they have that the communities offer. One of the reasons for doing this presentation of the board though, is because there's many more facilities than just the heavy maintenance facilities. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you can see here, even in this presentation, the maintenance of way facility, for example, uh, has the most economic, direct economic impact uh, uh, going forward. And so I think uh, what we see going forward is uh, laying out where all of these facilities would need to be to, uh, to have a, you know, a, a optimal uh, operation scenario make recommendations to the board, accounting for uh, some of the elements that are needed uh, in the communities for these facilities and inform the board of that, and then ultimately uh, move toward uh, an action. But again, the big idea, I think in a way, unfortunately, the heavy maintenance facility by itself has taken on a life of its own as, uh, as this uh, <clears throat> grand prize. And what we were attempting to do here is say, you know, there's many other facilities that are needed and so we had to talk about all of this and, you know. my question was about all of them not just heavy maintenance 
And it also includes, you know, to have an optimal workforce, they have to have affordable housing. You know, middle class jobs. Uh, th those are the kinds of things that I would be interested in. Now. Thank you. Any other questions from board members? Do you have your maintenance? You said about 60, 70 people, 65, 70 people, and that it would ramp up to three to 400. Is that during the high maintenance operations? Is that yes? Yeah, so yes. it wouldn't be like a permanent three to 400. No. no. No, it would not actually, uh, you know, and the 65 could be 100 during assembly, but but essentially you have a, a more stable workforce that then peaks during the midlife rebuild for about four or five years as right. a rebuilder. And of course, the more trains you have in service, the longer that re rebuild period would, would be. And right. then at the end of that period, it would probably decline back down to, you know, to a lower number. And then the maintenance of way with staffing of about 100, 110. That, that would be fairly consistent at all times. Each, each, each facility, that's okay. correct, and it, uh, that would be fairly consistent at all times. You would have some peaks when you you have a recapitalization program, and so therefore you would you would recapitalize some of the uh, project elements, infrastructure as required. And during those periods, you would you would ramp up for several years to recapitalize. And you said there would be three of those. Okay. There's actually four, uh, four abating its way in addition to the Central Valley, I believe. Spread out between the LA oh, Basin sorry. to. I'm sorry, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah, then I was looking at light maintenance. Yeah, they're those, they're, those are, the, and that the staffing for the light, main, uh, light maintenance facilities would be fairly uh, consistent. Uh, they would go up based on if you increase train service. And there you are increase about more trains. Each, in each station, each and, and again, it's dependent on how many trains you run because yeah. that also headquarters the crews. So, right. but essentially that would be it. And then you'd increase in. Where, uh, as trains increase, you'd increase the obviously the crews that go with the trains. Yes, thank you for that presentation. Um, could you go a little bit deeper into the economic benefits of the maintenance away in the heavy maintenance facility, initial and ongoing? Uh, <clears throat> uh, the the exercise was was actually completed by our finance department and and I, I was not involved in the details of generating or how that was generated uh, i'm not sure if, uh, if there's someone here who could elaborate but essentially it took into effect all of the uh all of the associated costs direct indirect and induced uh there is a model that they use uh, and i don't do not know the name of the model the model that they use to generate those uh those numbers, but I can okay. certainly uh, yeah, come, back to, have them come back to you those and the board there. with the appropriate response to our details of okay. the modeling that they use to achieve that. Okay. Yeah. There we go. I think uh, <laughs> I answered the question that we did uh, work with uh, Frank's team and the early train operator to estimate the number of positions, and once we had the uh, position types uh, calculated, uh, the, the compensation that those workers would get and then uh, applied some standard measures of these indirect costs and induced uh, or indirect benefits and induced benefits as a, a ratio type exercise to get to the total numbers. So could you give us a deeper dive? Not right now, but sure. if you could send us something, I'd appreciate that. Absolutely. Now, now the a um, couple of years ago, we did go to Spain and visit a lot of their facilities. And if I recall correctly, the heavy maintenance facility had a staff <clears throat> excuse me, an ongoing staff of approximately 300 people working three different shifts. So do you envision that that's the way this one would be, give or take a certain number of staff? Yeah, the, the heavy maintenance facility uh, would have a, could have a three three shift operation. However, it's all, also dependent on, on uh, how many trains you have and how many trains you, you are operating. <laughs> Okay. So at mm -hmm. full build out phase one, when we're operating uh, almost 80 trains a day, uh, you would probably have 10% uh, of that work for the fleet at the HMF, and therefore you do those repairs that way. When you're having, when you're starting out with six, 10 trains, you would not have a fleet sufficient enough to have more than one shift operation at the HMF. Right. Makes so it's sense. going to be very dependent on where we are in the operation in terms of the phase and the ramp up. 
So, now, so that you made, a, you made a comment that uh, at the heavy maintenance facility that the the, the trains may be assembled there. That if be, not there, where? Well, it depends on who the successful bidder is. They might have uh, facilities in California. They might have uh, facilities in the adjoining uh, states that they might already have built and, and under you know operation that they might uh, <clears throat> assemble and then transport it. So. We would encourage that they use the facility for uh, assembly. We would encourage that they, uh, you know, uh, bring the jobs to California on the early onset. But it's really dependent on the on the, who the successful bidder is. Okay. No, there's been no determinations though on that level. No, yet. no, not at all. We'll make the property and the assets available so that to encourage <clears throat> them to do that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Now, you you had also mentioned that um, as part of the environmental review, some sites have been cleared. What are those sites? They have done an initial review of them, make sure there's no fatal flaws. There's nothing that, that would prevent us from going forward. I can't name all nine of them off the top of my head. Okay. Uh, you can send us a list. Send but, us but they were they were solicited. They're across the Central Valley from uh, uh, from Kern County up to uh, up through Madera. And um, so they've done an initial environmental uh, look at all of them, make sure there's, there were uh, no fatal flaws. And then we would have to do some additional uh, final environmental on whatever the final selected site would mm -hmm. be. Okay. Assuming, assuming we move forward with the Merced to Bakersfield alignment, what would be the sequencing of these facilities along that corridor? Maintenance away uh, sites would be required first. Uh, and then uh, a maintenance, uh, heavy maintenance facility uh, second. Uh, the, the control center goes concurrent with the maintenance away facility because it's part of the tracking systems. Uh, in the Central Valley, I would assume that the initial light maintenance facility will be concurrent with the heavy maintenance facility since it's an interim service and you won't need two separate uh, sites for the Central Valley. And then finally, the operator will be the last to join the party and uh, that'll be the headquarters location. Okay. Now, question, Brian? Yeah. What would be the, the timing of this decision making? <laughs> uh, some of that gets into um, how quickly we have a determination of what we're doing next. Okay. And so, um, you know, when we, if we have an interim operating service, uh, as I'm going to talk about a little bit in the CEO report in Central Valley, we would be uh, coming forward on starting to identify the location of these. Uh, facilities as we as we mm -hmm. uh, move through that, that initial uh, interim uh, service. Okay, so is that then the timing of decision Merced to Bakersfield, or is it after the business plan, or is it after that? It's going to get a feel. Um, I'm, what I'm trying to get to is if we are uh, certain that we're moving forward on the Merced to Bakersfield uh, plan, we would then get to work on coming back uh, to this board in 2020, likely, yeah. on when the uh, and and make a staff recommendations for where we would locate okay. some of these facilities. Right. As I think you know more than most, uh, at least with respect to the heavy maintenance facility, uh, it's been sitting out there for a number of, number of years now. And I know there's a lot of anxiety in the communities up and down the valley. I think uh, once we get into uh, specificity on what we're doing uh, in the valley as an operational matter, we can then come back to the board uh, with a rec set of recommendations for. Uh, where these would be located. Okay, I think it just speaks to the need for decisive decision making so we can give staff the direction they need to move forward. Uh, my last question for you, if you were visiting a a, a country uh, to compare their facilities, uh, maintenance away and heavy maintenance, where would you go? Uh, you have all of the modern maintenance facilities, so both uh, heavy maintenance facilities for, for trains and for uh, for uh, infrastructure are all ex excellent. Multiple countries I've been at, I've visited them uh, both in Europe, uh, m several countries in Europe, and I think uh, almost all, of any of them that are constructed are, are good examples that we could use. All right, thank you. Are you recommending the board meet at one of those uh, facilities? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I second yeah, that. Frank, Frank, one question. Yeah. The, if it's a maintenance facility, um, the difference, there is a difference between a diesel maintenance facility and one that is dealing with electrified uh, trains, is that correct? It's, it, there's two, two areas of difference. Uh, one is whether you have what we call a unit train, where like in a high-speed train, all those cars are connected together and it takes hours to take them apart. 
versus what you're used to at an Amtrak or something. You could very quickly take them apart and you can you can maintain each car separately. Uh, in a unit train, you have to maintain the train together. So therefore you need a jacking mechanism that picks up the entire train together versus just a single car. So that you have that ch difference. And the second difference is obviously you need a, a uh, high level platform to maintain your pantographs and uh, catenary to bring your, your uh, train, electric trains in and out. So those are two kind of major differences uh, in the facilities. And what do you anticipate more of a skilled labor towards those who have dealt with electrified trains? Uh, obviously, uh, you, you have more of a high voltage motor electrical uh, technician type background versus uh, more of a mechanical type background for diesel engines. Well, the reason I ask is to follow up on Len Shanks or Director Shanks' uh, question about those communities. If in those individuals to participate in the economic mainstream of all this activity, that we would have training for those communities to participate. And one is a little more sophisticated than the other in terms of diesel versus the other. Uh, there's been a great response in the Central Valley from, from uh, the local universities, community colleges and tech schools. I mean, uh, I, I'm really impressed with the response that they've had in putting in programs, both uh, to develop the skill sets that we're going to require and for coordination with uh, European countries for, for that development and that technology exchange. But this so is I think not that's unique to you, the Central Valley. I'm sorry. It could be, this is not unique to the Central Valley. It could be the LA corridor, it could be San Diego. Except that the Central Valley has has yes. stepped up over the, over the six or seven, eight years that I've been here to actually implement programs and have them in, in place today. So it's very impressive. Uh, just a couple things, uh, just to follow up. Uh, I, from what I understand, you said earlier then, Frank, I think it's what you were reflecting on the employment at the or staffing of the heavy maintenance facility. It was upon completion of phase one, and that when during phase one operations, you're contemplating 300 to 400 full time employees. Isn't that correct? I mean, I'm that would be the upper end, but yes, I mean, that could be a side that high. Yes, your slide. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I don't know if that. I'm just clarifying yeah. with. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, will that ramp down then from? But the, it'll ramp down. So it's, not, so it's yeah. not. We need to be careful in that. In that. It's it's the the ramp up is for midlife rebuilds. But as we build from 20 trains to 40 to 60, by the mm -hmm. time we start building trains, the first 20 will be needed to. To rebuild by the time they're finished, sure. the second set. So depending on how the phasing goes, it might be for decades uh, in terms of the higher number. <laughs> and I think you, uh, thank you. Uh, just a second, quick question. You said the the life of the train set is approximately thirty years. Yes. So can you what goes into the determination of that that life? And would we expect in California with, let's say, our weather conditions, the hours of operation, the speeds of operation, etc. Were those things all, are they all incorporated in determining that 30 year period? Yeah, I mean, it's part of the design, life cycle design, and when we put sure. out the train manufacturing. But obviously, the number of miles you run it every day, yeah. how well you maintain it every day, the number of customers that are in and out of it every day. So those are all part of the, of the determination. The 30 years is an average, obviously, uh, that we would expect from, from a high speed rail train design. Uh, but based on its use, uh, and, and you know, it could be 25, it could be 35. But, but overall, I think you'd see a 30-year life is generally the industry accepted uh, okay. time. But frame. right now, we're just using what the average is. But oh yeah, we, just we, uh, we industry would, averages. Yes. On that down to the real expectations here as we get farther down the road. That'll be part of exactly what what the final. That'll be part of the evaluation of the final final uh, train manufacturer. Yeah. Also, it's a key reason why the maintenance is part of the uh, the contract, because uh, they're going to be responsible for the costs associated with that maintenance, and it encourages them to be more efficient on the design. And uh, you say it impacts operating costs. And yes, and exactly. And reserves. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Right. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Very helpful. Okay, so we'll move on to item number three, the audit plan and quality assessment. Do 
Good morning. Good morning. I'm Paula Rivera, Chief Auditor for the Authority. I'm here today to request your approval of this year's audit plan and to advise you of the results of our internal assessment of the Audit Office Quality Assurance process. The audit plan is a combination of carryover work from last year's plan and new audits based on input from executive management and the Finance and Audit Committee members. This year's plan represents a diligent effort to match planned audits to existing resources. The internal quality assessment is part of the Audit Office Quality Assurance System. All audits go through two levels of management review prior to issuing the audit report. The internal quality assessment is performed each year of the audit documentation of selected assignments against the audit standards we follow and our processes contained in the audit manual. In addition, every three years, the audit office is subject to an external peer review. Our next peer review is in February. So even the auditors get audited. That's what I said. International standards for the professional practice of internal auditing require that the internal audit plan and resource requirements be approved by the board. The standards also require the results of the internal and external quality assurance reviews be communicated to the board. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. This is a, um, an action item to approve the internal audit plan. Are there any questions? I was going to move. Move it. Okay. It was moved by... You know what? I don't okay. Know. Are you calling? Director Shank? Yes. Vice Chair Richards? Yes. Director Curtin? Yes. Director Camacho? Yes. Director Miller? Chairman Donza? Yes. Director Perea? Yes. Director Gilmetti? Motion carried. Thank you. We move on to agenda item four, the CEO report. <clears throat> uh, good morning, members. Uh, Brian Kelly, Chief Executive Officer for the ISP Rail Authority. I want to inform you all that. I towed, tied this bow tie all by myself uh, this morning. And I'm very pleased and proud of myself. Thank you. <laughs> because my, I know my counsel, Alicia Fallow, loved bow ties. So anyway, <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, members, I'm here to provide the uh, CEO report for uh, today's hearing. Uh, one element of this will have a, a s short uh, PowerPoint presentation, which you are now. Uh, now seeing, but before I get to that, just a couple of uh, sort of things to catch up a little bit. First, uh, as uh, uh, Chair Mendonca, uh, Mendonca mentioned earlier, uh, several members of our authority staff and the board uh, participated in the Governor's Region's Rise Economic Summit in Fresno. The focus of the summit was on championing solutions that grow California's economy, improve environmental quality, and increase economic opportunity, uh, three issues our project is heavily invested in. And Chairman Mendonca and ex-officio board member Joaquin Arambula were featured speakers. The authority was a proud participant in the first day of the summit and included various tours of the key areas around the Fresno region. Uh, Chairman Mendonca and Central Valley Regional Director Diana Gomez uh, led a tour of two of our active construction sites uh, for two dozen attendees from around California, uh, allowing participants to hear firsthand from some of the workers who have been uh, placed on the project. Uh, thanks to the Helmets to Hard Hats program. Uh, also attending the summer were board members Henry Perea and uh, Tom, Tom Richards. Uh, following his keynote address of the summit, Governor Newsom met with members of the press and separately did a sit-down interview with the Fresno Bees editorial board, uh, where again he reiterated his support for the high-speed rail, emphasized his desire for the state to use the existing and available funds to develop the 171-mile Merced to Bakersfield line as an interim operating uh, segment in the first building block of the Silicon Valley to Central Valley line. The governor also reinforced, reinforced the long-term goal of securing additional federal, state, and local funds and private sector participation, uh, noting that the only way we'll do that is proving ourselves, getting a real project going, and being able to test this technology, the first of its kind in the nation. Uh, as members know, uh, I also just want to report that, again, we did 
uh, under our reason. Sorry. Uh, under our recently uh, approved NEPA assignment from the federal government, we did uh, approve the first record of decision in some time here at the authority for the final 23 mile route between Shafter and Bakersfield in the Central Valley. This is a major milestone on two important fronts. Uh, first, it allows the authority to move forward on project development into Bakersfield. And second, this is the authority's first finalized environmental action tinkered under the state's newly uh, granted NEPA assignment, as I said. The staff involved in finalizing this document deserves tremendous credit. Uh, more than 100 stakeholder meetings occurred, 17 public comment and te technical working group meetings, and 15 monthly regulatory agency coordination meetings went into this process. Uh, we're proud of the collaborative and cooperative uh, process that went into this effort with our local partners, and this action environmentally clears the high-speed rail route as it extends to the station location of F Street uh, in downtown Bakersfield. That is a route uh, that, uh, as board members know, uh, particularly those who have been here for some time, was a, a collaborative uh, route or alternate uh, selected with the city of Bakersfield and the county of, county of Kern. Uh, we also announced that we have uh, reached an agreement with the Bakersfield Homeless Center uh, that paves the way for the potential expansion of the center and a new facility within that city. This agreement was made necessary due to the fact that our future alignment will affect the homeless center directly. And under the agreement, the center, which is the only emergency shelter for homeless women, children, and families in the city, will remain in its uh, current location for some time while it works to relocate to a new location. We were pleased to reach this agreement because we were committed uh, to assuring that our project builds better communities. And this was a prime example of working closely with the city of Bakersfield, the homeless center down there uh, to move forward on that, that agreement. Um, as members, uh, many of you members know, I think now on November 12th, we had a, a field hearing with the Assembly Transportation Committee uh, in Fresno on November, as I said, on November 12th. Uh, we took uh, members of the committee who uh, were available for that hearing uh, on a tour of the construction site um, and showed them uh, Avenue 12, the San Joaquin River Viaduct, and the Fresno Trench uh, sites. The purpose of the hearing, of course, was to review the status of the high-speed rail project. I testified at the committee along with uh, Vice Chair Tom Richards, Board Member Danny Curtin, uh, CEO Mark Evans from uh, Deutsche Bahn, uh, uh, and uh, folks from the legislature, the peer review group, uh, as well as Stephanie Wiggins, the CEO of uh, Metrolink uh, in, uh, uh, in Southern California. Uh, we are also getting a lot of questions about the status of the 2020 business plan, so I wanted to comment uh, on that as well today. Um, the authorities governing statutes, as many of you know, require us to adopt a business plan to be submitted to the state legislature uh, no later than May 1st, every two years. That May 1st date is the final uh, draft of that business plan. The statutes provide direction regarding what must be covered in the document, uh, including uh, expected schedule for completing environmental reviews, an estimate, an estimate of anticipated funds the authority intends to access to complete construction, any public-private development strategies being considered for implementing the system, and a discussion of reasonably foreseeable risks. In addition, updated ridership and revenue forecasts, uh, capital and operating costs, life cycle costs, and other estimates are required. The authority staff is in the process of updating our forecasts and estimates in preparation for issuing the draft 2020 business plan in early February. And again, that provides for a 60-day public review. In addition to summarizing the progress made over the last two years, the plan will focus on the challenges, opportunities, and key decisions anticipated over the next few years. These decisions will be informed in part by two reports requested by the board earlier this year related to early interim services in the Central Valley, a business case being prepared by our financial advisor, KPMG, uh, and the side-by-side -side analysis that our early training operator is now working to finalize. As you will recall, in October, you were briefed on the qualitative results of that ETO side-by-side -side analysis, and they are uh, working in real time on the quantitative uh, elements of that that will uh, also inform uh, the business plan preparation. Um, again, the business plan will focus and be structured around the progress underway between now and 2022 uh, and, uh, and, um, and our intention to have the full environmental clearances by phase one 
uh, a clear strategy for completing uh, all of the requirements under the ARA grant agreement under that deadline scenario and uh, prospects of uh, up to 350 miles of electrified high-speed rail uh, that could be under project development uh, in, in California at that time. Um, I do want to move, before I go on to the next uh, topic, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, where we are. This is a graphic that you've seen before. I used this at our October hearing. I used it again at the November 12th uh, hearing with the Assembly Transportation Committee. Uh, if I am describing the status of electrified high-speed rail in California today, it looks something like that. Uh, the dotted lines there are where we are still in the environmental uh, process to get through or the environmental documents we must complete uh, in time for the uh, ARA grant requirements. And the green uh, solid lines are where uh, in 2020 we could have a full project development underway for electrified high-speed rail in California. The 51 miles, which you are familiar with, with the Caltrain electrification in the Bay Area, the 171-mile stretch connecting Merced, Fresno, and Bakersfield uh, in the middle of the state. Uh, again, the environmental document we just cleared into Bakersfield. The next environmental document we will clear is the extension uh, into Merced and the Y uh, that starts to turn west into the Bay Area. And then finally, and the thing I'm uh, very encouraged by is the uh, emergence of the Virgin Train System in Southern California, uh, which the state of California is a full partner in that public-private par partnership. And there's 130 miles of electrified high-speed rail um, happening there as well. Um, jumping forward to, uh, I think I'm jumping forward, yep, sorry. Jumping forward to 2022, uh, again, if we stayed the course on where, uh, where we are right now, um, uh, we would be in full construction of those 350 uh, miles of electrified high-speed rail in California um, in those uh, same segments and all of the environmental work uh, completing the environmental work into Los Angeles uh, and I Anaheim and through the Pacheco Pass uh, into Gilroy, San Jose, and all the way to San Francisco uh, will be complete. So in the next 18 to 24 months, full environmental work would be done. Uh, and again, um, under construction as much as uh, 350 miles of electrified high-speed rail in the state of California. I'm trying to move the slide here, but I'm failing miserably. There we go. Um, I got over aggressive, sorry. Must be the bow tie. I think it's too tight. Uh, <laughs> some of the members have asked about important decisions that go in that uh, are on the horizon for us going forward. Uh, um, and what we have to do to get to some of those, uh, those decisions. And again, I think uh, one area where we will talk about this again will be in December when we go before this board and talk about the status of the track and systems contract that is uh, we've been out on the statement of qualifications for. We'll be reporting that statement of qualifications to this board in in December uh, and then seeking to get approval to move forward on the RFP for that. But what this is intended to show are so, sort of uh, once we make a decision on with clarity on what we're doing next, it then opens the floodgates to a series of additional decisions that we could and should make if we are uh, moving forward with sort of uh, a clarity and focus. And, and what this shows is, uh, you know, uh, we, we've sort of made a call now to move forward uh, on the track and systems uh, statement of qualifications. Again, we'll be reporting on where that is from a competitive standpoint at the next hearing and talk to the board about how we move forward on that RFP. But also getting clarity on what's next beyond 119 miles helps us get to other things that we need to resolve. As you heard earlier today, there was a presentation uh, from Frank Vaca on uh, maintenance facilities, uh, light maintenance, heavy maintenance, maintenance away facilities, uh, and where those kinds of things would be located. Uh, getting going on the next operation or the first operational segment would help us define and, and locate those facilities and come back to the board uh, with what those look like. Um, we uh, ultimately have to get to a decision on procuring rolling stock if we're going to move to a uh, movie, uh, 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 a segment where we have electrified trains and operations. Uh, that is a long lead time procurement that we'll need to get moving on. And so that's another issue that sits uh, waiting for us once we decide uh, what the initial decisions are. Uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we have already cleared the Bakersfield uh, stretch into downtown Bakersfield. Uh, look, from where 
from where I sit and the way I think about project development and the mission and the direction to the staff is once you clear an environmental document, it provides the first opportunity for us uh, to demonstrate that we're moving forward on project development and into construction in a way where we've learned our lessons from the past. This is the first opportunity, this element is the first opportunity where we can show that we'll have a new and aggressive strategy on right-of-way procurement, utility relocation before we get into full construction uh, of that next segment. And so I'm eager to get going on uh, that project development work into the Bakersfield stretch. And our next environmental document, which sits out about 10 months from now, is the Merced stretch. Uh, uh, both the uh, stretch into Merced and the beginning of the uh, turning west uh, toward the uh, Pacheco Pass, what's called the Y. Uh, that'll be done in September of 2020. Uh, and again, it'll present an opportunity for us to then move forward on how we do project development uh, in those areas. And then, of course, uh, there's an MOU operating agreement that uh, we'll need to execute uh, for early operations in that Central Valley segment. So uh, again, it was asked earlier, um, what kind of decisions are on the horizon uh, for us and, and what is the import of getting a clear direction on what is our uh, next steps? Uh, this, this document here is designed to sort of reflect uh, what some of those things are. If we get clarity on what we're doing beyond the 119, we then uh, get to the next set of decisions uh, that can be made uh, to show us advancing the project and be very clear uh, on our focus and, uh, and direction going forward. So that's what that is designed uh, to show. <clears throat> I'm happy to take any questions at this point or I, I can move on with the CEO report. Why don't you keep going? We can do questions. Sure, okay. Um, there are a couple of uh, uh, configuration changes and a settlement that I want to describe to the board uh, that uh, went through both our BAC committee and yesterday uh, went through the executive committee. Um, the first is a configuration change. Uh, this does not have a dollar sign assigned to it yet. It will come back to the board for any necessary change order. But recently, the authority approved changing the Kings Tulare Regional Station, what's called Project 517, from an at-grade structure to an at-grade station with an eleva elevated platform, a decision that was made in collaboration with Kings County and the city of Hanford. This configuration chain yields several benefits, including the most uh, that most of the right-of-way required to complete that structure, uh, which has a smaller footprint, has already been acquired uh, and handed over to the contractor. In addition, uh, with this change, the authority will not need to modify the Union Pacific Railroad line at this location, uh, nor will we need to relocate a major pg e transmission line. Uh, this change includes refining the station location with necessities, uh, which necessitates, sorry, an environmental re-examination but does not create a constraint to starting construction of the viaduct uh, structure. The authority will now negotiate a change order to implement this change, uh, the cost of which was anticipated and accounted for in the revised uh, program baseline adopted last May uh, in 2019. Uh, due to the benefits described above, including the greater schedule certainty toward achieving the federal ARA deadline, uh, this change we believe is in the best interest uh, of the authority of the state in the project. Second, um, I had come before this board twice before to talk about settlements we have reached uh, with the contractors on uh, time impact analysis or uh, delay claims that have been sitting for some time, both in CP4 and CP1. Uh, yesterday, I also approved uh, uh, and informed uh, Chairman uh, Mendonca, but we uh, approved yesterday a settlement agreement with uh, Dragados Flatiron Joint Venture, addressing a series of uh, delays associated with securing right-of-way, utility relocation, third-party agreements, and authority-directed change orders in design and scope. Uh, per the delegation of authority policy, I reported to the board chair that this settlement had been reached. Uh, through this agreement, we have cleared the cost associated uh, with these delays through a modification of the contract budget of $133.9 million and a time extension to April 18th, 2022. A comprehensive analysis by the authority's independent auditor helped inform this agreement, and because of this agreement, a potentially higher potential risk exposure has successfully been avoided. Uh, these costs were identified and accounted for again in the Rev. 1 program baseline adopted in May, and with the agreement, the funds were moved from the contract con contingency to the contract budget. As a result of working through these issues with DFJV, a more collaborative relationship has been established 
which has already led to increased construction progress. This agreement also provides completion date certainty uh, both to the contractor uh, and to the authority. Uh, so again, uh, it's part of uh, settling uh, old claims that have been uh, sitting uh, for some time. And as part of our effort to move forward on the project, uh, we have now settled with each of the contractors for uh, delay claims. Um, I think I mentioned already, uh, uh, went through the, uh, the decision tree, and so that's the next, uh, uh, next item that I have here, but I already uh, walked through that, so I think I'll uh, skip that for now. The last thing I will share with this board, uh, in this CEO report, and I think you have a copy up there. If you don't, I'll get you a copy. Uh, but we are adopting dates for the 2020 board uh, meetings. Uh, staff has contacted your offices to try to make sure we can uh, schedule those in a way that uh, work for uh, as many board members as possible. Um, you will see as we get about four months into the new year, uh, we have met uh, on Tuesdays generally. Uh, we have found that that does create some problems in finding offices and uh, uh, venues for uh, hearings uh, because so many local governments also meet on Tuesdays. Uh, and so uh, we, there is a, a recommendation in about the fifth month of May and going forward that our hearing dates would move uh, to Thursday. So I have a proposed schedule for the board meeting dates uh, that uh, will be shared with you. If you're not in front of you now, they will be uh, shared with you today. That is um, uh, reflective of um, uh, uh, Tuesday meetings for January, February, March, and April, and then shifting to Thursday for the remainder of, of 2020. Uh, and again, uh, uh, those dates are uh, in front of you, and uh, that's how we intend to proceed. Uh, with that, Mr. Chairman and members, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Can I ask you uh, one question just to elaborate a little bit on? You said that as part of the map that you showed that the Virgin contract, the yeah. Virgin build out is an important public-private partnership yes. to the state. Can you just spend a couple of minutes talking about what that is and why it's important? Well, uh, you know, I, I think what the mission of this authority is and, and uh, is really the the uh, the transformative effort to, to provide electrified high-speed rail uh, operating in the state of California as soon as possible. And I think there's a couple of things that have changed about the Virgin Project that make it a very exciting uh, thing for us. The first is uh, the ownership has changed and is now moved to uh, Brightline Trains, who is an operating entity in Florida uh, today, uh, and Virgin, which is a well-known commodity in transportation circles, mostly in the airline uh, industry. Uh, but uh, they both have credentials in the transportation sector, and they've also committed now uh, to electrified high-speed service in that corridor. Um, so that uh, is an exciting uh, uh, thing that's going on in the Southern California Basin. The, the state of California is a partner on that project in several ways. Uh, the first is they have come before the uh, Tax Limitation Committee, uh, Tax Allocation Limitation, I always screw up their name, but the Tax Allocation, Tax Credit Allocation Limits, anyway, uh, the committee that, <laughs> that gives out uh, that, that uh, provides a, a tax exempt bond authority for projects in the state of California. And they have gone there to seek that authority for that project and it was approved. Uh, they've also gone before the infrastructure bank for uh, what are essentially uh, private activity bonds, also an ability to seek uh, lower uh, access to capital for that project. Uh, that was also approved by the infrastructure bank here in California. We have entered an MOU uh, with uh, Virgin Trains uh, with the state uh, transportation agency. Uh, this authority, it, it, um, it's a high level document, but it does uh, uh, talk about us cooperating with them on the extending to Palmdale, which of course, as you know, is a station stop for us. Uh, it does talk about uh, how we can work together on things like interoperability uh, issues and perhaps joint procurement issues. Uh, and so the commitment that they've now made to move to high-speed electrified rail uh, is a very helpful one. The other thing that I think an opportunity that is presented here is uh, there is a big question and, and it's not a secret that um, we have enough funding to complete the environmental work uh, all the way from San Francisco to Anaheim in the next uh, uh, 18 to 24 months. And uh, how we put together uh, potential public-private partnerships to extend to Palmdale and beyond and into the LA Basin, I think this uh, emergence of this uh, project provides opportunities that we've only thought about before. 
The last important part of this partnership with the state of California is that the state transportation agency secretary uh, is the uh, person under the law who would uh, work with them on the right of way uh, for them to build. Uh, I'm pretty jealous of them uh, on this in this regard, but uh, virtually all of their right of way uh, for that project is public right of way. It's owned by uh, Caltrans, and so the state transportation agency uh, secretary will be the one who will see uh, work out the agreement. I shouldn't say see, but work out the agreement for them to access that right of way for construction. Uh, Virgin, as I understand it, uh, they do have some things that they have to finish. They have to revisit a federal environmental document, um, uh, among some other things. Uh, but I uh, think they're intending to break ground in 2020 on that, and they see a construction timeline of about four years getting them into 2024 horizon. So I see great potential there. I think, uh, Mr. Chairman, as you mentioned uh, in your opening statement, the business plan, uh, what I hope our business plan will do and what I intend to have the recommended business plan that we provide to you all uh, in uh, February, uh, not just talk about how we will go forward, but also talk about, uh, as we've talked about in past business plans, the need and the desire to stabilize cap and trade funds, not just for this project, but also uh, what it could mean for uh, uh, our regional and local partners and things that they want to do, and really uh, use that to uh, move forward uh, shared corridor investments both in Southern California uh, and in the Bay Area as part of that that structure and the ability to uh, to use a uh, cap and trade funds to to make that possible. So I think there's opportunity. I think the emergence of the Virgin Train is an important uh, thing for electrified high speed rail uh, in California, and I think the business plan will articulate opportunities for us with uh, stabilized cap and trade funds. Uh, also, I should just mention relative to cap and trade, uh, our CFO, Brian Annis, reported to the FNA committee that the last four auctions from cap and trade have netted this authority about $762 million. Um, our, our budget uh, exercise that we do in the, in the business plan uh, at the low end assumes only $500 million of cap and trade dollars. Uh, in practice, over the last nine or 10 auctions uh, since AB 398 was passed, which was the bill that extended cap and trade for 10 months, we're bringing in about 750 million uh, a year. So there's a uh, great opportunity there. Now, not just, uh, uh, again, uh, make sure we get done what we need to get done, but also talk about what surplus cap and trade revenues can go for. Um, we probably wanna talk about putting some in a project reserve, but then also uh, perhaps making some available for look ahead investments in some of these other, other regions. So there's a lot of ways where we can move forward um, uh, not just with what we intend to do in the Valley, uh, but in each of the three key regions of this project. And I'm looking forward to the business plan uh, talking about each of those. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Uh, just a, a quick question, Brian. Yeah. Uh, my curiosity, do we know uh, what what they're looking at as their ultimate budget on the Virgin uh, I know on the capital side, it's an estimate right now. Um, on the capital side for their uh, structures on the order of $5 billion uh, to invest in, in in building that, just the capital elements of that uh, project. Okay. Uh, I think that's where they've been uh, on on the, what they're uh, bringing to this for the capital expenditures. Yeah. Be interesting sometime to mm -hmm. uh, just put a pencil to paper to see the difference between our project and, and their project mm -hmm. and how being on Caltrans right away is really such a benefit to yeah. them. Yeah. It's a good question. I mean, I, you know, I also think that the, um, I mean, uh, you know, from where I sit in my time here at this project, I think it's um, our struggles in the Valley or where we've been have really been, in my view, uh, at the risk of being simplistic, uh, have really been tied to just the, the timing of uh, commencing construction at risk and doing in the risk I'm talking about is, um, not having the right of way in hand and not having the utilities uh, identified and uh, for relocation. I think uh, that's, a, that's something that we will not repeat. And therefore I don't expect us when we go forward on new construction segments to, to see the kind of challenges we've had in the past. That wasn't simplistic at all. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Brian, yeah. can you, do you know if the state of Nevada is, is financially contributing? 
I want to be clear that the risk on the on the uh, capital and the risk on the revenue from the project is being uh, taken uh, even here in California by the private entity itself. Uh, we are not putting the state of California uh, at any risk in offering uh, access to low access uh, capital. I think the same kind of request is coming of the state of Nevada. Not that they're putting in uh, direct state dollars, but that they're also being asked to provide uh, access through a state mechanism for low low access or low capital uh, uh, options. So it's the same kind of approvals that uh, we've provided here in California. Yeah. <clears throat> Brian, the, yes, uh, I think we can all agree that the Virgin uh, train is very much dependent on for total success uh, for us to connect to them. Um, yes. I think it would be, you know, a waste of dollars for them to think that, that Victorville is, that people will drive from Los Angeles to Victorville to pick up a train to go to Vegas. Don't be so sure. They'll, they'll just be, you know, it's Vegas, don't be so sure. But uh, realizing that it also impacts the um, our state in terms of ridership and, and who knows what it'll do for ridership. Realizing that they're in the construction, what is the date that they're looking at or anticipating completing that? that I, 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 I believe, I'm going off of memory, so, no, that's just <laughs> and again, that's really tight. Um, the I think the uh, uh, estimate that they have for is, is roughly a four-year construction window. So, so I think they, they see a 2020 start date. Again, assuming that all of their approvals are done, the right of way is in hand. Uh, and I see that I believe their plan was to uh, commence construction uh, sometime in 2020 and come and, and wrap up the, at least the capital elements uh, in around 2024, 2025, that timeline. So realizing they could be done in 2024, hmm. um, does that? Uh, change any of your thinking relative to what we should be doing to have a system up and running uh, in the LA quarter? Um, well, it affirms my thinking that we should move forward on an expanded electrified high-speed rail system in California. And so, uh, and so, what I mean by that is, um, look, I will, I will tell you what I think. Okay, <laughs> what I think is this. Um, uh, this board has made policy decisions over the last several years uh, that since I've been here, my single objective has been trying to focus on those, put clarity to those, uh, redouble our commitments to those, and execute those. And so uh, that includes electrifying the Central Valley. And so uh, I, 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 what I think is vital is that we, uh, since the day I got here, was get out of the orchard in the southern terminus in the valley and get into downtown Bakersfield. Uh, extending to Merced, according to our ETO, after a study that we asked them to do and indicated in the business plan we'd asked them to do, uh, the Merced to Bakersfield run has been the recommended uh, section to initiate service. What I think is vital is that we get that done. We demonstrate that we can run the technology and uh, we provide high-speed electrified service over 171 mile stretch we complete the work with Caltrain in the Bay Area, uh, and we help move along the uh, uh, Virgin train system in the Southern California segment. Coupled with that, I think it's vitally important that we complete our environmental work uh, in these segments uh, by in the next 18 to 22 months so that we are all clearer on what the routes could be to connect. And I agree with you. I don't think they have any intention of going Los Angeles to, or Las Vegas to Victorville. Uh, I think that uh, they want to extend the Palmdale and ultimately down to LA. And the way I look at it is, I want to get that environmental work done. Uh, we all know that we're going to, that uh, there's funding gaps for both the Bay Area segment, uh, which we were clear about in the 2018 business plan, and for the LA segment, which we were clear about in the 2018 business plan. But I think what we can do is once the environmental work done is done and they have advanced their project, uh, we can really work together to figure out um, how we might be able to uh, share resources, assets, and opportunities to fund beyond Palmdale and into LA together. And that, that's even, what I'd like to but do. But even looking further south, yeah. knowing that, that Lynn Schenk is a big gambler, yeah. that she enjoys this, this, yes. this, the anticipation of the trip to Vegas yeah. from San Diego. So we, San Diego is, is at least 
moving forward their thinking about either coming through a parallel to the five or the five to and 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 going to the 15 as opposed to necessarily mm. coming into la mm. so they do have some alternatives mm. and we have to be able to take it i think we as a group have to take advantage of those mm. alternatives when mm. when in fact they benefit us and and so we keep an open mind about yeah this this opportunity i mean look the, the, this is where i associate myself with something the chairman said at the outset i, I think the key to, look i'm here because i believe Electrified high-speed rail changes the game in California. We all do. So I want to. So so I'm very eager to move forward on it. And I guess what I would say is, I think the key to doing that is stabilize our resources, expand the pie, and enable us to do it as quickly as we can. Uh, so that that's I know the you're doing the best in that areas. area. Then. That's that's great. Thank you. So what really intrigued me was the 250 extra in cap and trade for the last nine auctions. Yeah. Is that accurate? Well, it's not. I wouldn't. I mean, I wouldn't call it extra. What I would say is well, we we are budgeting 500 or no, no. Okay, that's what I wanted. To so I mean, let me my, let me my be, years per let me be clear. $2 billion. Yeah. So the, since the uh, since the legislature <laughs> passed AB 398, which extended the cap and trade program to uh, to 2030, it has stabilized the market. And so what's occurred since then is that uh, the uh, percentage that comes to us is about 750 million a year. In terms of our budget, to be clear, uh, we have presented a budget in the business plan that makes assumptions about cap and trade. The low end is 500 million, the high end is about the 750. We're coming in at about the 750. Uh, so uh, again, as, that, as we move forward on what we intend to do, uh, as, uh, as long as that auction stays uh, robust, I think we'll have the ability to both build a reserve and potentially be able to uh, do some look ahead investments as well. Uh, I also think if we stabilize cap and trade as we've asked for in past the business plans, and this is uh, perhaps with both the extension and solidifying uh, what uh, a floor for, for us to make it financeable, uh, that has the, uh, the additional benefit of providing more money to others as well. So is the 750 uh I know we have a range 500 to 750. Where is that in the 20.4? Uh, uh, it's it's the 20.4 is based on 500, and 750 gets us to about 23 and a half, okay, which is articulated that is, that in is the two point something. Which, or even yeah, more, but that's uh, articulated in both the project update report and our business plan as our budget range going forward. So I can't agree more that anything we can do to stabilize cap and trade. And extend it because it's not financeable without it being mm. extended. We've had this discussion mm. for years, and you know it was a tough sell mm. uh, in the first place. But if we could manage to do that, <clears throat> I think we'd be operating from a, a little bigger pie and probably a lot less stress. Yeah. So, uh, I just want to make that comment. I don't know where we are in the discussion, but I want to clarify that. Thank you. I just want to thank you, Brian, for that, because it's really exciting to see this, um, this particular graph, because we all know when you get influx of private, a lot of things can start happening and opportunities. I do think the converse of that is that you have to remain um, with your eye on the initial prize and be stable and be um, consistent with your activities, particularly as a government agency. We have to um, make sure that we don't... Um, you know, we don't move and shift and create all different kinds of um, al alternatives and scenarios because when private investment looks, they look for stability and they look for some some certainty and definite certainty mm -hmm. in terms of return and all kinds of things. So I really appreciate this because it does show um, a lot of progress and it shows um, willingness of the private sector to be involved. Granted, it's an, a Las Vegas route, which anybody in their right mind would like to be involved in. Um, and public right of way, but I'm I'm wondering um, a couple things, which is um, is the Palmdale route their preferred route, or do we do they have a preferred route? Well, I think their initial objective is to get from Victorville uh, Victorville to Palmdale. There is a, uh, uh, for example, I think they're seeking uh, with uh, uh, LA Metro and with the State Transportation Agency uh, some planning help to 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 get that 50 mile stretch uh, uh, done. But it's probably fair to say that if it was electrified high-speed rail, that would trump a um, a bus or a 
no no question about it yeah well, i mean for totally example like... i think if i if i understand your your where you're going the, the you know there is a currently a, a for example a, a metrolink service that gets to palmdale right there it's is. a fairly circuitous route because it has to go through the mountains it right. probably takes about uh, two hours today and it. just by comparison the two hour route from burbank uh, to palmdale uh compared to our system is ours would be 25 minutes um, so electrifying that stretch is key and trying to shorten the, the route right thank you sure other questions uh yeah i'm quite intrigued by the uh virgin express myself and it was part and parcel of the discussions that were happening when i first got on the board <laughs> and again it was in pre prior uh, uh, previous ownership which was uh, not quite as focused but there was a discussion about it and uh, just as i got on the board we decided to move north as opposed to in the early uh, valley to valley linkage uh, i don't think there's any question that the la I'm, I'm sorry the las vegas link is driven by the uh, you know the market in Southern California basically LA area, um, so there's never a question about getting to Palmdale. They've already expressed that repeatedly, uh, and we have all the opportunity for that. And I know LA Metro's in those discussions as are we. And I believe Metro Link itself is in the process of upgrading Palmdale to Burbank. I don't know how much time it would uh, cut off the existing thing, but it'll be some, it won't be that dramatic. The problem, like all of our problems right now, or at least a big portion of our problems now is there's a tunnel between Palmdale and Burbank, or there's a mountain between Palmdale and Burbank, let's put it that way, or more than one. And there's no tunnels, no money for tunnels. And if we had the money to build those tunnels in that 25 minutes, I mean, when you say that to people in Los Angeles, you can get from Burbank to Palmdale in 25 minutes. It's like a game changing thought. I mean, you talk about transformational. It's, uh, and they are looking at that now because of the housing situation in Southern California. So I think that there's no doubt that that will be a, a game changer, even without the tunnels, because I think they're far down the road. But it does argue, and I think uh, Director Camacho was pointing this out, that the sooner we can make an investment in the Burbank Anaheim mm -hmm. corridor, uh, the better. And so uh, I wanted to uh, certainly talk about the Virgin train, and that has been on the conversation for quite some time. I know you talk about changes, but we have a, um, a bit of a problem in the fact that we do not have the money for, the money for any of the tunnels between Bakersfield, Palmdale, Palmdale Burbank, and more to the point between Gilroy and the Central Valley. So it is a unique time, much com more complicated than most times. And I think uh, we should discuss the options that are available. Uh, nobody on this board is uh, not for getting a high-speed rail electrified as soon as possible, but I think more in terms of the system statewide. So um, I wanted to make sure that we don't make the decisions before we get all the facts and so I want to go back on this chart a little bit, Brian, the ones with the boxes and the squares, which is always interesting to me. Uh, could you go, look at that? Yeah, the early interim service. So one goes down to the bottom, one goes to the top. Are those uh, mutually exclusive or are they just two steps we have to take? Because they, they almost look mutually exclusive. But for me, the top box that it goes to the delivering the 119 miles that's the absolute mandate we must meet within the next couple of years. I think it's two years. And I, I don't see anything on the discussion of that, but we did get this report, confirmed the report. Was that discussed at the Finance and Audit Committee? Okay, so hopefully we'll get a little bit of report on that. Are these mutually exclusive decisions here, or are they, I mean, I know the electrification portion is, is the key issue uh, that people keep talking about, but I think there are options within these two uh, I mean, we have to do the top one period end of discussion, and it definitely leads to the bottom one, uh, depending on how we approach it. But there are a distinct set of issues in between there that I'm hoping we will get to discuss at some point. Um, and I'll leave it at that unless we want to talk about it now. But if we're going to get a report on the uh, well, uh, to the extent upgrade. I understand the question, I, what I'm 
what's reflected here is that, uh, first of all, uh, we're very clear, and we've been very clear in our public discussions and documents on both the 2018 business plan, the 2019 project update report, and we will reiterate it again in the 2020 business plan, that our first priority is to meet our federal obligations. And so we will do that. Uh, that 119 will get done and we will complete the environmental work under the timelines of the FRA uh, document. Uh, the point that's being made uh, here is uh, where we locate operational and maintenance centers for electrified high-speed rail uh, depends on where you're operating electrified high-speed rail. And if we are only doing the ARA grant, uh, uh, we're not necessarily operating electrified high-speed rail. So in that sense, it's a little bit uh, different. I think the board's going to have to wrap their heads around the question of whether you want to spend between 15 and 20 billion dollars on rail assets in the Central Valley and continue to run diesel trains because that's the fundamental decision that's going to be before you is we are uh, you're, you're either going to spend that money and operate fast electrified rail or you're going to spend roughly that money and be have 119 miles and run some kind of diesel operations. But these, these uh, boxes out here uh, reflect things that are, are definitely tied to electrification. And I would repeat again, electrification in the Valley is not uh, a new idea. Uh, this has been uh, uh, part of the funding plan that was adopted in 2016 by this board and by the Department of Finance director uh, that that stretch would be electrified. Uh, uh, and it's uh, been articulated uh, uh, in uh, an early interim service uh, document in 2016 that we provided to the Federal Railroad Administration. Uh, so uh, again, since I've been here, staff took where are we and said, you know, given our funding constraints, what makes sense under the policy direction that this board has already adopted? And wh where we ended up based on recommendations was to move forward on the 171 miles of electrified service in the Valley. And we think we can uh, cover that under our uh, estimated budget uh, based on cap and trade revenues and uh, the bond bill. Um, and so that's that's the recommendation. What this is showing is these are the decisions that you can then make for that electrified rail service. If you're only going with 119 uh, diesel, some of these other decisions uh, matter less. So Jim. I'm sorry. So when those decisions were made in the 2016 plan, uh, we assumed we had money to get through the tunnel. And that's why we actually moved from uh, northern Southern California base, because I think there were two tunnels in the way there. So we moved north. And we adapted because we didn't have the money. We knew we wouldn't have the money to complete two tunnels in the south. So we adapted. And now we're faced with not being having two, a tunnel in the north. So I'm not sure if the 2019 update report was an extension of like the business plan, because I don't remember that well, to be honest with you. Uh, if we, when we did the 2018 business plan, when we had knowledge of the fact that we wouldn't have enough funds. Yeah. I know that was in the 2019 update report. So again, it's going to be some complicated conversations, but I think they need to be had uh, because it's not simply be 119 and call it a day. Uh, I've said before that if we did 119 and left it at that, with or without diesel or electrification, it would be foolish. It's absolutely mission critical that whatever we do, we build out the Merced so that we have a connection from the Central Valley to San Jose and to Sacramento. It's just a question of how you do that. And, uh, you know, I think it's going to be worthy of conversation. Respectfully, I would just uh, point out that the um, decision by the board on whether to uh, electrify the, uh, the 119 miles was disconnected to the question of tunnel funding. Uh, the issue was uh, what, how you would get a usable utility segment for uh, the federal government. And what uh, the board indicated was that the preference was to electrify that. Uh, it was indicated in the funding plan adopted by the board uh, and the Department of Finance director uh, and uh, was articulated in the document we submitted to the Federal Railroad Administration uh, on exactly the question of the interim service for the 119-mile stretch. Um, we, you know, it's been, uh, we've been pretty clear with uh, uh, the public and folks uh, that we uh, have a funding gap on getting to the Valley uh, and we have a funding gap on getting into LA. Uh, but I think what uh, we, we try to uh, 
show here is that uh, that doesn't mean we can't advance electrified high-speed rail in California. And 350 miles under construction is second to like China in terms of the number of miles under construction in the state of California. Clearly, we have to go and have a conversation about how we close the gap in the South and in the Bay Area. Uh, I think it's a better conversation when you need new funding to have it be directed at closing those two gaps rather than continuing to invest where we've been investing for some time. So that's the dynamic that we've uh, tried to present. I think, Danny, you're right. The board um, has to have an important conversation. Um, and I'm sure you will have it. Uh, you have to have it because we have to make decisions as that decision tree shows. Uh, and we got to move forward. But, but yeah. since since the business plan of 2016, which people mm -hmm. referred to, mm -hmm. uh, we have lost um, <clears throat> the federal government's uh, commitment on the 900 and some odd million. Now they're beginning to talk about clawing back on the five five billion dollars that, that they've given, given us. So there are variables that do change mm -hmm. circumstances. And, and I think what what Danny is Director Hurden is saying is that we we need to things aren't constant. We made decisions based on what we do then. Mm -hmm. Things have changed. Mm -hmm. So do we do we continue to go down that path or do we look at alternatives? Mm -hmm. And I, I, I for one is saying just looking at Alternative is the best answer, uh, that we don't jump into decisions uh, uh, half-heartedly. Uh, you know, we I think we made some some mistakes, uh, in my opinion, about issuing contracts early on to, to spend money, and and um, there must have been good reasons for it, and I certainly uh, just don't know what they were. Uh, but uh, the variables have changed, and I think that uh, we just have to consider them. I just say the board has directed us to do uh, some additional studies and analysis of this. We are working to complete that work, uh, and that will certainly inform uh, this board, uh, as it should, both on the, the wisdom of the 171 as well as the uh, best use of our limited resources. So we will complete that work well, and really inform the board. Something that, see, mm -hmm. that may change a lot of these things. Right? Let's see. Oh, well, I think there's I think there's more good news too, which is that graph right there that's showing that there is private investment and that there is there you know things do change. There's no question about it, but it's also you know you, our our charge. We should be talking about these questions. There's no question about it, but um, you know you can't forget the good news too. And um, 2018, when I got on the board in 2017, we all we knew we didn't have the money for the tunnels. I mean, and we knew that we were still looking at electrification. So. Okay, Jim, and then him. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm the new guy on the block, uh, just trying to catch up. But one of my observations here is, you know, I'm a home builder, and we start with one step at a time. You build a foundation, you build the subfloor, you frame the walls, and so on and so far. And I think that we need to look at this as a step-by-step -step process. And to me, completing that segment from Merced to um, Bakersfield is, is critical on our mission is, is to provide high-speed rail. But the most exciting part for me is this, this memorandum of understanding with, uh, with Virgin. Um, and if you look at that little map where we've completed the environmental work, you know, they, they've completed it to Palmdale from, from Victorville. And we need to finish that direction from Bakersfield down to, to Palmdale. Now, if I'm uh, a, a businessman in Las Vegas, just completing that segment, you know, I know it's not to LA yet. You know, that's that's the next step. Maybe that's the roof that we have to put on. But there are millions of people who live in the Central Valley. And if I can get on a train in Merced or any of the Central Valley cities and end up in Las Vegas in a few hours, uh, that's a big benefit. So I remember listening to Assemblymember Friedman uh, down in Fresno last week talk about ridership. Uh, and I will tell you that if you complete that segment, you're going to really increase ridership on not only our line, but on the Virgin line. So those are just my observations. Henry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to follow up on... Uh, on your comments, I mean, that's absolutely right. People need to remember there are millions of people that live in the Central Valley. And, and making that connection to Vegas is a win. 
just as it is going to Los Angeles. But I think therein lies the opportunity as, as Director Curtin indicated, you know, we absolutely should be looking at increasing our cap and trade, uh, increasing the pie, not, not taking the pie from one piece or one place to another. Uh, so obviously I know staff is focused on that, but whatever we can do to help that effort, we should. And, you know, something Commissioner uh, or Director Camacho said at our last meeting, which was stayed in my mind, with, Ver with the opportunity that Virgin brings to us, I mean, we absolutely should be talking in, in greater, in greater um, amounts of time with them, as well as the money in Vegas and the money in, in Los Angeles that, can, that will have direct benefit of that line extended in LA. And, and to that end, you know, I don't know if this board does ad hoc committees, but we have some pretty talented people on this board and, very, and people that are very connected in those parts of the state. I mean, that we should absolutely be using those talents to, to open additional lines of communication for those folks. We need to then raise more money from, from the private sector. So I would just offer that, but I also just wanted to couple, you know, hit on a couple of points. One is, um, you know, completing the, the first segment and meeting our, our December 2022 deadline. Uh, and answered yesterday, Brian, very impressive. I, I asked Brian yesterday, how, how many work days left between now and December 2022? And I think you said about 800. And you're pretty darn close <laughs> to that number. I was, I was doing the math last night. But I think that that's a number that all of us, especially staff, should have taped to your doors every day. Because every day that goes by is every day that, that we're not going to get back to move forward to all of our deadlines, but most importantly, that deadline. And when I look at the phase one, uh, you know, questions I ask, being you, I'm, I'm sure there's been a lot of discussion around it, but there are 11 structures in, in the first segment that are behind schedule. Now, looking at the reports from this morning, and I'm still grappling on reading, reading the reports and, and what incomplete uh, format you're telling us, but one thing that, that we do know is we, we are having problems or have had problems with the third party operators, whether it's, it's uh, UP, the um, PG&E, or the telephone folks. And so, you know, we've asked for that kind of information. You know, what are the issues for each, each structure? But more importantly, what is the plan and the timing of that plan to clear each one? And, and, and I know staff is working on that. And I think once we get it, every board member should have that so we can look at that. Our job is not to micromanage, but certainly to hold accountable, folks accountable to, to our deadlines and, and what we need to get done. And I think once we have that, then we match that against that 800 days. <clears throat> and we understand we can't lose a day without being productive. And everybody knows that. The, the last thing, Mr. Chairman, I'll just uh, comment on is um, that uh, last chart that was presented. And, and I just wanted to give a, a valley perspective. You know, when I, I understand that we all know, you know, there's this, this discussion about decision making and the timing of decision making and whether we're going to go from Merced to Bakersfield. And there's, there's uh, I think, operational issues maybe attached to that, and there's political issues. We all know that. But, but what concerns me is when I see diesel, and I can't believe any legislator in L.A. or in the Bay Area would think it's a good idea to add more pollution into the Central Valley, you know, Valley that's already choking with pollution, with the population that we have, um, you know, heavy Latino population, African, I mean, you name it, we have it. And to say that somebody thinks it's a good idea to put diesel trains on a 119 mile, 117 mile segment um, in the Central Valley, quite honestly, is very insulting. And uh, you know, if there are legislators that, that believe that that's a good idea for the Central Valley, I, I'd like to hear from them personally, because uh, I don't think that's, uh, that's why we are here. I believe that um, our mission is to build electrified high speed rail and to deliver it in California. And as we're seeing with that Virgin line, we all know, even though we're 50, 60 years behind the world in this, in this endeavor, uh, this system one day will shoot across this country. And we should, we should revel in that. We should be a part of it. We should be doing whatever we can to increase the pie, but not diverting the pie that we have now. We need to get it done. So yes, I agree with the director that are saying we need more information. I, I get that. You know, we all make, informed decision based on the information that we have. But I think the sooner we have the conversation as this board of what we're doing or where we're going, 
the better off California is going to be. So I just ask you all, let's just get it done. Let's have the conversation. Let's make decisions. Okay. Sure. I will be very brief. Uh, I was happy to hear Jim and Henry's uh, thoughts. Uh, yesterday, I had an informal conversation with, with Brian and said that uh, the time has changed. When we were going to the private sector, they wanted state guarantees. They wanted, I mean, they had us on the defensive. Things have changed now, and especially with Virgin coming in. And what I suggested is that we start having some brainstorming sessions, whether it's with Goldman Sachs or Bain or, or J.P. Morgan. I mean, these are the guys who know how to bring in private money uh, to take another look at getting those investments because everybody here understands and they certainly understand that there's going to be a tremendous return on their investment. And I'm, I'm going to, if you can just stay there for just a minute. Out of committee report, and if there's any questions, we'll, we'll, then we'll wrap. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll make this very short uh, today. Um, the audit committee met uh, before this meeting. Uh, I think that we would conclude that we are certainly seeing progress. Um, it's not as much as we would hope to have seen by this time. But it does seem to me that, uh, and, and I think my colleagues would agree, that uh, our chief operating officer has, has done a job, albeit, uh, again, we would have hoped uh, faster this year. I think there's an expectation from what we heard today that we'll see uh, more of, of the results of that in the form of expenditures. We are, the information that we've seen through uh, today's meeting is for the first quarter of this fiscal year. We need to be spending to meet our budget somewhere in the neighborhood of 188 million a year, excuse me, a month. We're averaging about 60% of that right now. Um, we are focused very much on 2022, uh, as is uh, management clearly and chief operating officer. Uh, we'll look anxiously towards the improvement of, of uh, that spend rate, which is the way we can define how we're moving forward in the construction. Uh, other areas that are very important to the ability to succeed, uh, eight, about 85 percent of the parcels have been delivered in the Central Valley, which is a huge improvement over the course of the year. And in the third party areas, I think 94 of 114 uh, agreements have been uh, entered into in the Central Valley. Those things have been very much a part of our inability to move this project forward. So when I say encouraging, I think that is encouraging. We've now got to, and I think that what we've done or what management has done is they've placed uh, the appropriate uh, tools in place with the agree agreements that have recently uh, been had in CP1 and 2 3 with regards to uh, moving, giving the uh, design build contractors an opportunity with a little excuse for moving the project forward. So our whole, I would say we're cautiously optimistic. I think we've got a substantial task ahead of us for 2022. And um, what I like is uh, the clarity of the information that we're receiving. So we just got to see if that clarity now comports with, with the performance. I think that's about it. Great. Okay. Other um, just one comment um, I'm actually you know happy to hear your report because uh, it, it, for me and I keep raising this at the meeting this is mission critical and if you want to talk about confidence that's just the one thing I'm sorry if, if, uh, if you want to talk about confidence this is the one thing that's going to either build or break confidence uh, I'm not as worried about the national situation as many may be it is what it is <clears throat> we'll have to deal with it whatever it is but it is a pretty strong leap from where we're at in terms of spending. Um, I know it sounds like a lot of days, but it's actually a lot less than it sounds like because it's 24 months, 25 months. And there's really, unless you start working around the clock on weekends, which is going to be, we'll meet the burn rate if we do that. And if we have to, we have to. Uh, I'm very pleased that it's moving forward. I know we have a lot more to do. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions or comments for 
Afternoon, committee. Okay. Um, just make a couple of closing comments, and then uh, we, I don't think we need an executive session, so we'll adjourn. This was a very encouraging meeting. I felt that, the, as uh, Vice Chair Richard said, the clarity and progress about what's happening on the FNA committee's discussion was very helpful. It, this is hard work, and I really want to express my appreciation for all of the team's work in staying focused and ensuring, as uh, Mr. Curtin said, that this is really about delivering what's in front of us. That's uh, been, been a very important focus of this board and the staff to make sure that the most important thing in the near term is that we deliver what we've committed to do. And I'd like to commend everyone in making progress on that front, so thank you. I'd also like to say from my standpoint, having participated in a number of the conversations with Virgin Trains through my role, I chair the IDANC as well. This is a really important statement of sophisticated private capital saying they believe in the commitment to electrified high-speed rail in California for the long term. They would not be making this kind of commitments unless they believe there was something here. An important element of delivering in the long term the promise of electrified high-speed rail for California is that we are going to have to have that commitment from sophisticated private sector investors as well. And to me, it was a very encouraging movement. So that's why I wanted to make sure you spent more time on it, Brian. So thank you on that front. Um, I look forward to the ongoing conversations. We've got some important decisions in front of us in the next couple of months. We have important reports to the legislature early next year. And uh, it's important that we keep our head down and deliver this and make something great for all Californians. So 